Okay. So now, Father, we thank you. Lord, I want to pray. I don't want to be presumptuous and think that I can do this in my own strength and power because I know better. But God, we just invite you in. We invite your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would teach us, that you would give us understanding, fill our hearts with your spirit and with your love because we need you, Lord. We're desperate for you. And so we pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we, it will serve us well to remember that what Deuteronomy is. It's a sermon that Moses was preaching to the nation of Israel before they go into the promised land. And so he is, a lot, most of it is a review of the law that was given in Exodus and in Leviticus. And these are, this is a review of what was given in Exodus. If you want to, if you want to take notes and, and uh, jot down the scripture references so you can chase it down and look for yourself, it's Exodus 12, Leviticus 23, and Numbers 28, I think. And if I'm wrong, forgive me, but you can consult Rabbi Google and get the right verses <laughs> if you need some help finding it over there. I, I do it a lot. But anyway, what I want to do is read the majority of this chapter and then come back and, and go through it. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing the Word of God. Chapter 16, verse 1. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Verse 2. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the same place where the Lord chooses to put his name. Verse 3, you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days. Nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. Verse 5, you may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight. At the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall roast and eat it in the place which the Lord your God chooses, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. Uh, verse 9, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. Verse 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Verse 15, seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce 
and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. Verse 16, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. Okay, let's stop there for now because there are the three festivals or feasts that uh, God required the nation of Israel three times a year to come to the place where he caused his name to abide, Jerusalem. And so, so, so we don't get to do it our way. We don't get to stay home and, and, and just uh, say, well, I'm having church at home, right? Because we're going to the place where the Lord has, right? That's where they were. Now, uh, I'm going to put this up here. Because three times, three feasts were uh, by the law required for the nation of Israel to come to Jerusalem to celebrate and rejoice in the Lord. But there are seven total. But how do I say this? Three times they were required, but those three times encompassed seven distinct events, okay? Okay. All right, now, the Hebrew calendar... Is, yeah, the, the Hebrew calendar is a little tricky to follow, and we'll look into that in a little bit if, if, if the Spirit moves me to do that. But, but that had me tripped up for a couple of weeks here. I'm digging trying to understand this. And buy, I want to go on the record and say that I by no means understand this exhaustively, okay? But I'm going to share with you what I have. Okay, so we got... Up here, we got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks or Pentecost, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, feast of tabernacles or booths. Now, let's go through those and, and, and determine what they meant at that time for Israel. Then we'll come back and go what they mean for us and actually the whole world uh, describing God's redemptive plan in Christ, okay? All right, so uh, in Egypt, the last of the curses or the plagues that God brought down on the, the land of Egypt was that he had them sacrifice a Passover lamb, paint the blood on the doorpost, the lintel, and the threshold. That makes a cross, okay? And if the home was covered by the blood, then the destroying angel would pass over it. If it was not, the blood wasn't on the doorpost, then the firstborn male of that house died. Okay? So, that's what it represented to them. God wanted them to remember that. How he had spared them. How the destroying angel had passed over and to them they're remembering that i'm sure they're grateful for it and i'm sure they were glad to celebrate it that way but also at the time of year when passover comes around that is the time that they have just gathered in the barley crop so barley harvest has just been gathered in the lord is providing here he wants them to meet on the 14th of nisan oh but it said Observe the month of Abib. Verse 1, chapter 16. Observe the month of Abib. Abib is the Hebrew word for the first month of the calendar, the Hebrew calendar. It's the Hebrew word for it. Pre-Babylonian captivity, where Brian's been teaching us out of Daniel, before that it was called the month of Abib. Also, God created the earth in the month of Abib. Did you know that? I didn't know that either. I stumbled onto that, and I thought, how cool is that? So, okay, so it was called Abib then. After the Babylonian captivity, it was called Nisan, because Nisan is the Babylonian word, which they all had their Babylonian education and all that stuff. Daniel and all them, they were educated in the Babylonian education systems and so on and so forth. So after the Babylonian captivity, they used Nisan to describe the first month. It's the same thing. If there's no difference. You know, Jesus was uh, 
crucified on the 14th day of Nisan. Well, that's the 14th day of Abib. That is the day of the Passover. Now, the Hebrews, they adjust their calendar. Now, I just, just want to spit this out here so I can get rid of it. They adjust their calendar every year so that it will line up with the lunar cycles so that Passover will come at the right time in proportion to the Sabbath so that they can begin to count right to count the, the 50 days to Pentecost and wind up, okay, they, they do. They adjust that calendar every year. They also have two uses for their calendar. They have a civil use for their calendar. Uh, the, the civil use or the societal use of the Hebrew calendar, the month of Abib or the month of Nisan, is the first month of the year. That's when New Year is. But the religious use of the calendar, we know that they celebrate their New Year in September at the Feast of Trumpets. And so that's a little confusing, right? But if, 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 you're, if you're struggling with it, I, I was trying to explain why there's so many differences. The Bible's not contradicting itself, but things have evolved and things have changed, and that Hebrew calendar stuff is a little confusing. But that's why you see these things. Their religious celebration of the new year is in September at the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so let's move on. So we're in the month of Abib, keep the Passover. So we were supposed to be, we're required, all the men are required to be in Jerusalem at these three feasts. They've just brought the barley harvest in. Hang on to that, okay? Hang on to that. Uh, and then, so they're going to, on the 14th of Nisan, they're going to they're gonna have the, at at twilight, at dusk, when they left Egypt, they're going to have the Passover and they're going to begin to eat the only unleavened bread for seven days, okay? After the Passover, the meat that they cooked, the lamb that they cooked for this Passover meal could not be kept until morning. It had to be whatever was eaten that night, okay? You're going to get rid of it after that. What does that remind you of? The manna in the wilderness. You could gather up on that day what you give us this day, our daily bread, Jesus prayed. Give us this day, our daily bread. We're honoring the Lord. We're honoring the Lamb, the Passover Lamb, right? And I'm not talking about, bah, I'm talking about Jesus, right? Okay, so, uh, and you can see that the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts immediately after the Passover, right? In order up there on that list. And then the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits, if you want to go to Leviticus 23 and check it out for yourself, the barley harvest has come in. They brought a sheave of the barley harvest with them to celebrate the Passover. After they celebrated the Passover, the very next day began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Before that happened, they brought the first fruits of their crop. Just like we bring our tithe and put in the basket, they brought the first fruits of their crop, of their barley crop, and the, gave it to the priest. The priest waved it before the Lord, and then that began the, the, the countdown. From that day, from that time when he waved the wave offering and received the offering of first fruits that began the seven days of unleavened bread and it also began the countdown seven Sabbaths until Pentecost. Now, what did Pentecost mean to Israel at this time? What significant happened on the day of Pentecost at this time? That's the day Moses brought the law down off Mount Sinai. Yep. Moses brought the law down off Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments on the day of Pentecost, right? Okay, now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, we read it uh, when it got time to leave Egypt. They left at dusk 
and they had to leave in a hurry. So as they made their provisions, their meals, their stuff to take with them to eat along the way, they didn't have time to let the dough rise. So they had unleavened bread. And if you enjoy your communion cracker every morning, you realize that that tastes just a little bit bitter, right? Well, there's a reason for that. Because that unleavened bread represents the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus. When he said, this is my body given for you. That was a bitter pill that he swallowed so that we could have life. I, I'm getting this all mixed up, ain't I? Okay. Anyway, so if you look, then first fruits actually takes place right there. That's, that's the timing of it. Okay. But we have to do it there. And that's where the countdown to Pentecost begins. The Feast of Weeks. Passover happens after they've gathered in the barley harvest. Pentecost happens when they've gathered in the wheat harvest. And I don't know where the grapes and the fruit and all that stuff comes in. But when they come back in, let's go back over here and look at the Feast of Weeks again. The Feast of Weeks reviewed, it says in verse 9, You shall count uh, seven weeks for yourself, begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. That's when you have, that's representative language for when you have brought what you cut with the sickle to the priest that he waved it before the Lord. This is their tithe of their grain harvest, of their barley harvest. And then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord. That's Pentecost. Uh, your God with tribute of a free will offering from your hand. You shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. Did you catch that? You shall give as the Lord has blessed you. You've got the crop in, right? The first crop. You've got the barley crop in. And, 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 and if the Lord has blessed you and provided you with provision and with produce then he wants you to come and celebrate. I'm saying this as if you were Israel. Come and celebrate that harvest. God has provided you. He celebrate that. And enter into this Feast of Weeks. This, they call it the Feast of Weeks because it's seven weeks after Passover. Okay. And so then, then, then the third thing that they were required to be at was the... Uh, Feast of uh, uh, Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. But when they came back that third time, so what we've got, let's, let's see if I can, see if I can. So what we got is we got Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. All that happens. In the spring, March, April. You know about when Easter is. That's Passover. That's when that happens. Then in the summer, seven weeks from Passover, then you've got Pentecost. Now they list these together, but that's the first fruits is the, when the countdown starts. So you've got Pentecost. Then in the fall, it's in September, that's, that's Rosh Hashanah. Uh, that's that's that's. That's what we look at every year. That's what, uh, for the last few years, I've looked at every year, looking for the Lord to come on Rosh Hashanah, right? When the trumpet blows, you know, we're like sitting on the edge. We're going, are you coming to get us this time? You know, that, that's what that is, Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so you come back, you have the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, you, ha you, you have the Day of Atonement. And then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, all this... Uh, I'm not sure, or I have gone blank up here, one, about what all that meant for them. But the Day of Atonement is, that's, that's when they released the goat, right? The bull, and, and, and then they had the two goats, right? And one of them they sacrificed and ate, and the other one they released the the scapegoat, right? Uh, it's, 
I think it's both. I think it's both. But in, anyway, it's, this is the day when uh, in this religious system that Israel was involved in, in Judaism, in the law, in other words, this was once a year when they could have their sins atoned for. This is the day that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for the nation. Okay, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, it was representative of, uh, of uh, their... Uh, Coming in, yeah, coming into the promised land that God had provided them a place to live. Okay, but what does this mean to us? What does it mean to us? What do these things represent? And the reason that they're not exactly in the order because they mean something prophetically. And I don't know that I'm fit to explain this or not, but I'm going to take a stab at it. Because this is the redemptive plan of God in Christ laid out before us. Because Jesus, according to the Hebrew writer and according to the Apostle Paul, which I think are one and the same, but that, that could be argued. But anyway... That Jesus is our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed once for all on the 14th of Nisan. On the 15th of Nisan, he went into the grave. Unleavened bread. For seven days, we're going to eat unleavened bread. We're going to celebrate the broken body of Jesus. And so, and then first fruits. Uh, first fruits was his resurrection. First fruits was his resurrection. Paul said it again. He said, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. The, he's the first one to go through the resurrection because God raised him from the dead. We have hope that if we put our faith, our hope, our trust, and give our allegiance to him, that we can follow him through the resurrection and enter into that eternal kingdom behind him. He was the first one. He went through first. First fruits. Feast of trumpets. Now, this is when the Lord is going to come back. There's going to be a, a sound of the trumpet. Now, we're looking for the rapture. They're looking for the second coming. Although I don't know that they realize what they're looking for. But anyway, we're looking for the rapture. When the trumpet blows and the bridegroom comes to get his bride and take her back to his father's house... Uh, Isaiah said, while indignation runs its course, the seven-year tribulation, and then we're all going to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, and we're going to tabernacle with the Lord Jesus as he rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years. And so it's laid out there, and I may not have done a very good job explaining it right, but it's laid out there, the redemptive plan of God in Christ is, is, is right here in these feasts. And that's why they're important to us. Now, I know Paul said that we're not under the law anymore, but we can certainly observe. We can certainly learn. We can certainly appreciate how the law was the tutor that was taking us to Jesus, that all these things in the law were pointing us to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. And there's a lot of prophetic value in these feasts that I just don't know how to teach yet. I want you to know that. There's a lot about these feasts, a lot of prophetic value in these feasts that I just don't know how to teach yet. Okay? So I'll just be honest with you about that. But these feasts are important. And this law was important. Because if we don't confront the law, if we don't allow the law, to drive us to our knees, take our hand, and deliver us to the teacher, then we don't have any hope, right? Now, Brian's been teaching on Sunday mornings of how, and you hear a lot of people think, that a lot, a lot of people think that God's through with the Jews, done with them, uh, you know, that uh, they rejected and they did this and they did that and he's done with them, but we know that that's not the case. That's what the seven-year tribulation is all about. 
He's going to move. He's going to put in the last days. Joel said he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And those non there's lots of non believing Jews that are going to, even uh, maybe non believing every nationality, are going to come to believe. And they're going to die for it. But they're going to come to believe and they're going to be saved. And we're all going to be in that eternal kingdom together. Is this clear as mud here? Uh, <clears throat> now, I, I saved. This uh, last part, I, I think it's significant, and I don't know if I understand it as well as I did when, I, when it first hit me, but let's read this last paragraph, and then we'll get out here a little bit early tonight. You shall, verse 18, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates. Wait a minute. Everything in this chapter has been about celebrating all that the Lord has provided. The sacrifice, the blood that caused the destroying angel to pass over, bringing in the barley harvest, bringing in the wheat harvest, sounding the trumpet that assembles the people of God to him, to the mountain, uh, and, and to all, all the bringing them to, into the presence of God and celebrating the time when we're going to tabernacle with him after atonement's been made for, bringing in that harvest, recognizing that provision, celebrating with your family, praising the Lord, rejoicing to him, waving that grain offering in the air, sitting down and eating that meal at the table of fellowship, with God's family and celebrate, 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 right? That's what we've heard. Have you heard that? I guess you have now. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Verse 19. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just. That's fair. That's equal. That's balanced. That you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not plant for yourselves any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. You shall not set up a sacred pillar which the Lord your God hates. And so we've laid out this redemptive work of God in Christ that they were unable to see and sometimes we're even unable to see. God's grace is visibly seen in the law, His provision and His care for His people. I want you to come, bring your family three times a year. We're going to have seven feasts. We're going to celebrate. We're going to worship. We're going to fellowship. We're going to eat. We're going to party. But you shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not take a bribe. Why? Why is this so important on the heels of this? Well, do you want to be blessed? Do you want to be prosperous? Do you want to have a big crop? Do you want to have provision provided for you? Because it comes through the Lord. And the Lord loves truth. And the Lord loves people who love His truth. And we're honest with each other. And He said it right here. He's called us into His wisdom. But a bribe, which is notorious for happening among human beings, you know, when I'm in a little trouble or I need something to go my way. Terry, we were just talking about this, you know, uh, in that other situation that I don't want to say over the airways. But uh, people will bribe and people will cheat and people will steal. Why? Can you admit it? 
Because that's our carnal nature. And without a relationship with God, if we follow the path of least resistance, that is what we have to look forward to. If we want to be at peace, if we don't want our eyes blinded by the ways of the world, then a relationship with God in Christ is the way to make that happen. I notice that I'm a lot more honest these days since I got into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't just decide I'd pull myself up by the bootstraps and get that way. No, He did that. By being in a relationship with Him, by entering into His truth and entering into His grace and entering into His forgiveness and receiving His Word and trusting Him for my life, betting our lives on, it makes us honest people. But the danger is here. That if we don't, he said it repeatedly, repeatedly throughout this chapter. You can't just do it any old way you want. You can't just do it any old where you want. You've got to do it where the Lord said his name's going to abide. we got to do it where the Lord chooses. Not where I choose. Not the way I choose. i got to do it his way. i got to do it the way he says. I need his word. I need his plan of salvation. I need Jesus. If I have any hope of having the prosperity and the peace and the hope for the future that goes beyond this flesh and beyond this wicked world, it comes when I consistently and faithfully Now, this was repetitive and redundant, I'm sure. They walked many, many, many miles with a sheave of grain and a few goats and some bulls and some their families and their kids walking through the desert sand to get here to these festivals three times a year to have this thing. But that's the way to hope. How many of you think sometimes it gets redundant coming to church? We're going to hear that again. We're going to do those songs again. We're going to play that again. Man, I'm tired. You know, I work. I don't feel good. I'm the... But if we want the Lord's protection and His provision and His peace and His hope and His blessing, We have to change the way we think and do it His way. And I believe that, 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 and there's so many layers and so much more to this, but this is what I have for you tonight. Let's don't get discouraged as lawlessness abounds and as war is breaking out in the Middle East and we see famines and pestilence and sickness and disease and earthquakes here, there, and yonder and all the things that Jesus said, the way that we would recognize that we were in the last season. Let's don't get discouraged when lawlessness abounds and the love of many grows cold. We have to fight against that because His way is the way. Now, back up to verse 19. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. It's talking actually about giving a gift or money or bribery to someone judging a case or to get what you want, manipulation, whatever you want to call it. It's talking about that's actually a physical act. But in our day right here, who is the worst culprit that we're in danger of receiving a bribe from that would pervert the ways of justice in our own hearts and in our own minds. What bribe, what's bribing us 
to veer away from the truth of God's Word and from the sanctuary of His church. What is it? Say it louder. We have to watch ourselves because the propaganda that's coming across the news and the TV, the advertisements, the, the, the way that, uh, that it's presented that if you really want to be somebody, you should drive this and dress this way and you should look like this and act like this and eat at these places and go to these places and this is what you should look like, smell like, look like, act like. This should be your hairstyle. This should be this, that, the other, and all that stuff. All that is coming across the television to us at all times. What I'm not saying, shut your TVs off. I'm saying no, that all this stuff is designed to bribe you into the ways of the world that differ from the ways of God you understand where I'm coming from? That hit me hard when I was studying this past week. It's not just me saying, well, Barney, here, I, I want you to choose me over that guy. Here's some money. There's all kinds of bribery. There's all kinds of perversion of the truth. You know, we don't struggle against flesh and blood. We struggle against powers and principalities and wicked things in high places. The principality that we serve differs greatly from the principality that's in charge of this world system around us. So understand, we need a consistent diet of the truth and exposure to worship the Lord our God. And walk in the salvation and the peace and the hope and the protection that keeps us from having to fear in these last days. What's his name? Say it out loud. That's what these feasts are pointing to. They're pointing to Jesus, our Savior. It's not a time to quake in fear. It's a time to draw near. It was sufficient for us to be affiliated with the right group or attend the right studies or do the right things for many, many years. But in these last days, it's time to solidify our commitment to the Lord Jesus. And I'm not saying that we should be more religious. I'm saying that we should be more committed I'm saying that we should be more believing. I'm saying that we should be more interested and curious in what prophecy says. I'm saying that we should be paying attention and looking with a love. Amen.